We're turning to a new book. It's called Why Not a Warrior? And it's the story of Jem O'Connor, Cork Camogie legend, who is with us now. Gemma, good morning to you. How are you? Morning. I'm good. Good. What's the bit where you write the book, you put it in the shops, you tell everybody about it, and then you start talking about it again? What's this bit like where you're like, you have to revisit all the stuff that you've written, like probably four or five months ago at this stage? Um, yeah, look, to be honest, um, it was fairly, I think it was fairly difficult to get my head around when I was approached to do the book. Um, it was something that I wasn't overly eager to do. I suppose you have to talk about everything. You have to put your trust in somebody that you've kind of, that you don't really know when you have to tell every story and then what, you know, you kind of decide what, what goes into the book. And, um, you know, I'll be honest, the book isn't there to, to bad mouth or to go and relive any kind of bad memories or anything like that. It's probably trying to p- portray the best image of of the sport, my life, um, obviously experiences along the way. But um, yeah, it's it's it, it was pretty interesting. Um, it was good to relive some of the memories, some of the sporting memories and stuff like that. And, um, you know, I suppose, that's what I probably found the most interesting about it. Um, yeah, so the, the book is out. Um, it's uh, it's it's not just for people involved in camogie sport. I suppose it's uh, it wasn't uh, my personal life. It's 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 probably about life in general, really. Like you know, it's funny, Gemma, because we had Paulie Mara on the show this week, and, and he was talking about writing the book, and he never actually thought about writing the book, and it wasn't something he considered or even wanted to do. But uh, Michael Moynihan had approached him and asked him if if he if he'd do it, and once he'd done it, he found the process cathartic and and quite uh, rewarding like was it something similar for yourself that you got to maybe draw a line under some things and, and remember good times and bad times and, and almost like a therapy process yeah look I suppose in terms of the whole GA world I see myself as kind of a small fish in the pond really and when I retired I suppose I just thought maybe you just fade back into the background um, when you're kind of gone from the inter-county scene you kind of feel like that's it you're gone I suppose when you're approach, approached to them and to put it down into a book put, you know um, words onto paper, it's kind of a bit different, but um, yeah, look, I did enjoy it. If I was being that, if I if I'd been honest, I suppose there was times where I kind of felt like, um, you know, maybe I didn't want to do it. Would I pull out of it? Maybe I'm putting too much out there. Um, but yeah, look, I, I did certainly enjoy it, and um, you know, I've only got all positive positive feedback really back. You know, so it's been a it's been a good journey. Which bits did you not want out there? Sorry. Which bits were you thinking? This is too much. Um, it's it, it's not even anything in particular. Well, obviously it goes into my personal life and stuff, and I suppose there's a fine line there between um, keeping stuff private and then putting stuff out there. Um, but anything that's really there, I suppose a lot of people would know already. Um, obviously people that don't know me or don't know me personally might not might not not know those stories. But um, like I said, I suppose you know. Um, it's not like you're this big massive celebrity and you're there trying to sell books uh, and and create a story. You know, you're just like anybody else. And I suppose, you know, delving into your private life is um, is quite personal. So, um, yeah, I suppose that was probably the thing that um, maybe I was a bit reluctant about. Yeah, because it's not your story alone. It's the story of all of the people in your life who you're then putting down in print and going, uh, by the way, I've I've told a lot of people who we don't know uh, stories about, like, um, us. Are you okay with that? S- stories about which? You were telling, you have to tell stories about your relationship and you're like, you are you have to go oh. down and say, listen, I've, uh, I've, I'm not sure I got your permission for this, but I did it anyway. Yeah, it's, um, yeah, I looked at one or two people, I was like, you know, is it okay to talk about this or, you know, um, so yeah, it's kind of it's it's an interesting uh, it's an interesting journey, really. Like you know, when you talk, Gemma, even about the the outset of your career in the book, like uh, making that debut against was a Tipperary in two thousand and two. Like you're only maybe seventeen years of age at that time. Like, did you ever foresee that there'd be a career ahead with fourteen All Ireland finals ahead and and so much success? Um, I don't. I you know anybody that starts off playing sport and has the you know the honor or the opportunity to play at a county level or you know if you're playing soccer or anything at an international level or whatever it is you don't really see what the future may hold. You might know you might hold a certain kind of set of skills or talent or that might you know might put you on a platform or a pedestal to to kind of to. To be in position to 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 get to an Ireland final and and to wear the jersey year after year, but you certainly don't really think that you know you're going to achieve what 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 you what you've achieved. So like I suppose when I t- started out in 2002 as a 17 year old playing um, against Tipperary, I definitely didn't envisage 
um, what was to come later down the line. All I knew was I wanted to play for Mogi. I knew I had a bit of talent and I knew I wanted to work hard for it. And then, you know, whatever came, came. But um, that's just that's just the, the reality of it, really. And a record 11 All-Stars, which which isn't bad. <laughs> yeah. Um, it's, uh, I suppose, look, it's nice to get individual accolades. You know, when you play in a team sport, it's all about the team. It's all about, obviously, the individual working to the best that they can. And then when everybody does that, it makes for, you know, a, a very successful team. But um, I suppose at the end of it, when, you know, the hurlies are down, when the boots are off, and there's um, individual accolades. It's nice to be recognised, and um, you know I've been very lucky um, to receive those awards. Uh, the uh, decision to write the book and then to go through that process of it, right? What was the bit that you felt like was going to be the most compelling element of your story that you did want to share? Um, I suppose you know when we were doing the book, and I was talking to. Um, Sinead Farad, who wrote the book, and talking to Liam Hayes, uh, Hero Books, the publisher for Hero Books. I suppose, you know, I suppose the obvious thing as well is, you know, talking about your sexuality and stuff like that. And I've no issue talking about my sexuality. I've been always very open about it, something that's just a part of me. It's who I am. I never really saw it as something that I had to, you know, scream at the top of my lungs about. It was just always it's like anybody else you know it's anybody you know whether you're straight um you're you, whether you, you know if you're in a heterosexual relationship it's just who you are and that's the way i always viewed about it but i suppose it's very different than to talk about it and put it down on the book um and i suppose you know that's the fine line i suppose about your private life by keeping things personal and about putting it out there but i suppose when we all sat down and and spoke about it you know, I suppose you could be very selfish in, in the way that you might say, look, I don't want to do the book because I don't want to talk about things. But I suppose if by me talking about my sexuality and my experiences might help one or two people out there, you know, that are struggling to come out, um, you know, having difficulties with family or friends or people um, that they play with or they just, you know, can't realise basically, you know, that it's it's okay to be who you are. Um, I suppose that's probably the reason why I did speak about it. Um, because it's very easy just to close off and uh, say, look, I'm not comfortable talking about that. But look, you know, I suppose if I helps one or two people out there, then I suppose I, I, I've gained something in that. Did do you have somebody out there who you were looking up to when you were a kid that you could actually say, okay, somebody has done this before? Because there's, there's an extract of the book that um, you kind of talk about, well, you didn't formally come out, people kind of just knew, your family just kind of knew. It wasn't a, a, like a, there wasn't a formal kind of process for you, um, which suggests that you grew up in a really great environment, to be honest. That's the, the first thing that struck me reading that. Yeah, um, look, I've been very lucky, you know, for my family. Um, look, you know, it's not all plain sailing either. It's really, you know, it's not it's not easy by no means. But um, but for the majority of everybody in my family, it's been, um, you know, very accepting. Um, you talk about somebody that I looked up to in terms of maybe my sexuality and stuff like that, realising who I was, and maybe that it was okay. My uncle, John, my mum's brother, um, you know, he, he's gay and my grandparents are always very accepting you know people that came from that were born in the 20s and 30s never questioned his sexuality which i really kind of looked up to and they just accepted him for who he was and it was kind of the same for me um a bit you know in, in terms of that and that's the kind of approach that i took you know it's um it's something that I kind of wanted to go about in a way, you know, rather than, you know, saying, oh, I'm this, I'm that. I'm just like, but this is who I am. And this is my partner. This is, you know, it was just a part of life. Um, and look, I'll be honest, there was obviously very difficult things along the way. But um, generally speaking, yeah, I've been very lucky enough in terms of my family. We spoke, Gemma, to Ashling Mara on the show this week and, and she was talking about the, the the survey earlier this year. It was a news talk survey in conjunction with the GPA where um, 714 respondents, so 69% of female players surveyed were aware of a player currently out within their squad. It dropped to just 10% of awareness for male players and she spoke mm -hmm. about being surprised that it was even as high as, as 10%. Like, do you think there's something within the, the GEA culture or even the pub culture that surrounds it that maybe discourages players to coming out, especially in the male game? Yeah, look, I, I think I, I spoke about that. Um, it's, look, as I said, it's not easy for anybody, male or female. Um, 
But I suppose there's a, a perception out there that the shock factor is less when women in sport come out. Um, I suppose, you know, if you're, play, you're playing sport, you're, you know, some bit, a bit of a tomboyish um, character or the, a tomboyish element to it. And look, don't get me wrong, there's probably, more, you know, there's, there's more straight people, female straight people that I know than, than, um, than gay people out there. Um, but, that, you know, I suppose that, that perception for females in sport is that shock factor is less. In terms of men, um, and I suppose this is probably repeated time and time again, um, you know, men, there's a lot of pressure on men to portray a certain way, you know, to be that alpha male, um, to, you know, play a sport where it's very physical, like hurling and football, you know, especially in the GA culture, um, and, and, and unlike any other sport around the world, you know, rugby, soccer, whatever, but, you know, just in terms of the GA, that what we know, um, you know, it's a manly sport, that's the way it's portrayed. And, you know, the, the pub culture then kind of... Um, highlights that or it's uh it's boosted by that by by the egos and by the uh, by the fans of how people are supposed to to act and portray themselves and um i suppose that's the certain that's probably the thing that i probably don't like about it um and as i said it's not that you want people to come out and say oh this is who i am i mean again there's a certain part of your life that you you can be private about and you know nobody can deny that so if there are male um sports people out there in the GA that are gay you know you don't necessarily have to go wave your hand and say look this is I'm gay and I'm proud and I know that but it's um it's a lot harder for for male athletes to come out because of those reasons you know it must be rewarding though for you G- Gemma when you see and you, you spoke about this in the book as well you know even after your wedding getting messages you know from from people on Instagram you know saying that you're you're you know, thank you for being you, and you've helped me. You know, come out or, or, uh, I guess, speak to family about issues like this. So that must be quite rewarding when you when you get messages like that. Yeah, like uh, you know, I suppose when I, when we're getting ready to get married and stuff like that, and you know, my relationships, I don't really see anything different about it. No, it's, I'm I'm just so used to it, I suppose. But I suppose we forget about people out there, and I suppose people um, take for granted that you know. We still live in a in a society that still thinks that you know these type of relationships aren't the norm, and while we're very lucky to live in a country like Ireland, I suppose there's still people out there that find it hard to come out. And you know, out of the blue, I got a few messages just to say, oh, you know, thank you for for you know putting yourself out there, or you know, thank you for you've really helped my me along the way. And you know, and you know, I don't know these people, and yeah, it, it was really nice to hear that. You know, to know that I've probably helped one or two people along the way, and I suppose that's probably one of the reasons why, you know, those chapters were put into the book is to do that to give, um, you know, some a young girl, a, a young boy, not necessarily young people in their twenties, thirties that are watching this. You know, you have to remember too that there's a lot of people out there that probably might never come out. So um, it's um, yeah, it's it's interesting. I suppose this is it, this is all about helping people, really. It is interesting, right? Because like ideally, we'd never have to have these conversations, and it wouldn't be a big thing at all. But then, and you think of the progress that we've made as a society from like uh, the decriminalisation of homosexuality in 1993 to marriage equality which you know uh, also in retrospect like why do we all have to have a vote about that why do we just put it anyway but then there's that clown in Listowel last week coming out saying what he's saying and all of a sudden loads of people feel kind of oh well actually you know what uh, uh, there's there's, a, 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 there's definitely a, a congregation and I don't mean specifically in Listowel but there is a congregation of people who still share those uh, dinosaur views and unfortunately we do still need to have these conversations and that's why I think your book is going to be important for people to read and kind of for you just to talk about this normality because like that's exactly what it is. Yeah, it's um, you know the, <laughs> what that priest said was you know it's people might seem shocked or you know about it that you know <laughs> I suppose especially we, li- we live in a society too where if you look if you f- the flip side of it over is you know the whole freedom of speech thing and you know people are entitled to say what they say and when they do um you know people get picked up on it and there's a fine line between it all but i suppose when you're, when you're sending a message to the community about love and respect and about um i suppose christianity is about accepting people no matter what but uh, you know it's um it's a difficult one to to kind of understand um but yeah look 
I think there are people, unfortunately, out there um, that don't understand it. And I think that's okay, too. I think people have to realise, look, there are people out there, people that the older generation, maybe, um, and obviously the people is, you know, modern mindset people, too, still have it that might not understand it. And I think we have to portray the fact that that's okay too. I suppose the important message in this is that, you know, <clears throat> if you know anybody that's gay or you have a son or daughter or a cousin or an aunt or an uncle or whatever, what, what it is that, okay, it's okay maybe not to understand it, but it's so, I suppose the important message is to say, look, you know, I still love you. Um, you know, you know, we, we can talk about things and maybe I don't understand it or maybe I don't fully accept it, but, you know, I suppose the whole key in it is communication and just, you know, not um, abandoning people or um, kind of, you know, I suppose um, isolating people, you know, and it's about, it's about communication and it's about understanding and it's about, you know, listening to people and that's probably the key message in um, all of that, you know. Yeah, no, it's a, it's a the ultimate key message I think people will definitely take away from the book. One last thing, so you've obviously been involved in Camogie all your life. Uh, is there a plan into the future to get into coaching and management? Is that in your future, do you think? Um, certainly. Um, I suppose <clears throat> since COVID, I suppose COVID really was probably the finite time really for me to retire. Um, that kind of pushed the questions of me which I had um probably a way back um about retirement and I suppose COVID just kind of finished that for me um didn't really have the the support systems or the structures around you know you kind of have to do everything yourself and I think when you get older you kind of need you know you need a physio you need a rehab you need the people by your side to do things and I kind of finished that and then I suppose I took a break and getting married was a, was a, a priority because I spent all my life just giving the time to Camogie and nothing for myself or um, to Aoife, to, to my partner or to whoever, like, you know, so it was always about my time in Camogie. And then um, I was doubtful about going back playing club, um, but I back, you know, I went back playing club and stuff like that. Um, so, yeah, the time... The time is ticked by and it's certainly something that I'm, I'm definitely looking forward to getting into in the future. I just think I need to take a bit of time just to um, to enjoy life for maybe the next year, two years, and then I'd love to get stuck back into club coaching and um, maybe and hopefully into county, get involved at some level. Um, you know, just because you finish playing Camogie doesn't mean you have to close the door completely. So, um, yeah, I definitely would love to get back into it. Uh, Jimmy, you're a member of the Defence Forces as well and, and I know even, uh, I remember when you, you retired, I was reading a piece the other day, Claire Spellman, the, the Galway player, was talking about coming across you at, at Collins Barracks. Um, like, there th seems to be a lot of transferable skills there between, you know, being in a camogie team and being in a, in a, in a unit on the, in the Defence Forces. Like, the, the camaraderie and teamwork, you've been around that your entire life. It, it seems to be something that's quite transferable. Yeah, it's, um, it's, Look, I suppose every organisation um, has has good things and bad things about it. But you know, my my experience with the defence forces has been nothing but positive, really. And um, you know, I, I joined the defence forces because I wanted you know something different, um, an outdoor lifestyle, and I knew what the defence forces had an offer. The same thing, you know, teamwork, camaraderie, um, you know, loyalty, commitment, and all that. And when you're there, you know, it's it's like playing it's like playing sport when you're in that environment. It's a team environment. You don't do anything necessarily by yourself. Of course, there's you know, everyone has a specific role or a job, but you're working with people the whole time. And um, whether it's in barracks, whether you're in a training environment, whether you're overseas, you know, you need people around you and without that teamwork or that camaraderie, it doesn't work. If it fails. And it's the very same then on the pitch with Kamori. You know, in sport, it's all transferable. So, um, they go they certainly go hand in hand, and um, I've been very fortunate to experience both. And I, I think it's kind of, you know, it stood by me. Um, and it's uh, it's something I would definitely recommend to people that have any interest in the outdoors life and sport. You know, you can play sport in the defense forces as well. You know, there's a, a massive uh drive for that there. So um, yeah, look, it's uh. 
it's those characteristics definitely go hand in hand and I, I, I've only gained nothing but um but positivity from it and uh it's uh it's definitely uh, a good career to take uh, one last one sorry uh, where did the name of the book why not a warrior where did that come from um well it was kind of something that um Liam and Sinead kind of thought up of and um I suppose they just looked at my whole life my life experiences and you know being uh being a camogie player into county camogie player for so long the experiences that I went through I suppose you know in terms of my sexuality my um you know you talk about um your home life you know the people that you've lost um my experiences in the army and they put all that together and I suppose that's what they came up with you know and that's where the, the that that um that title came from so you know they asked me was i was i okay with that i said look i, I trust you you're the people you're the experts so um you know i suppose that's 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 why he was chosen by not a warrior well listen we wish you the very best of luck with it thanks a million for joining us this morning cheers I appreciate it Thanks a million for having me. Thank you. No worries. It's uh, Gemma O'Connor. The book, as I said, is called Why Not a Warrior and it's available now in all bookstores.